Hello, everyone. I'm Cameo George, the executive producer of American Experience, PBS's flagship and longest running history series. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am thrilled to be here tonight with acclaimed filmmaker Stanley Nelson for this event, Documenting the Struggle. This conversation is produced in partnership with the World Channel. So thank you, World Channel. Tonight, we'll talk about three American experience films that focus on and document the African-American struggle for equality in the United States. All three films, The Murder of Emmett Till, three-time Emmy Award-winning Freedom Riders, and Freedom Summer were lovingly directed by Stanley. Each film is a chapter in the fight for racial equality and recognition that continues to this day. We'll examine how these stories of persistent resistance are still relative today, and we'll talk about how public media can better empower filmmakers of color in telling these stories, helping to provide context and a truer representation of our collective American history. I invite you to write questions for Stanley and me in the chat box. We'll try to answer as many as possible during the discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our corporate sponsors, Liberty Mutual Insurance and Consumer Cellular. I'd also like to acknowledge the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation, the Yonke Foundation, Ford Foundation, Robert D.L. Gardner Foundation, members of the Documentary Investment Group, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, our home station, GBH Boston, and PBS for their generous support of this project. And now, the reason you're all here, it is my privilege to introduce Stanley Nelson, a 2002 MacArthur Genius Fellow and founder of Firelight Films. For Stanley's commitment to compelling narratives filled with deeply researched historical detail, he has received an individual Peabody Award, the 2016 Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, and the National Medal in the Humanities from President Barack Obama. Stanley's latest film, which he knows I love, Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool, provides the definitive look at the life and career of the iconic jazz musician. Stanley, thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, it's great to be here, thanks. Thank you. So as, as I said, we're going to show clips and have a discussion kicked off by three of your iconic films. Um, I wanna talk about why you made these films, the lessons that still resonate today, the things that are, that are important takeaways in those films. Um, and I wanna talk about the importance of being a filmmaker of color and telling, telling these stories. Great, sure. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a clip from The Murder of Emmett Till, but before we do, can you tell us about this film and about this story? Uh, sure, um, we, we made em Emmett Till, um, we're actually finishing up the first film that, that we did for American Experience uh, called Marcus Garvey. Uh, look for me in the whirlwind and, and we were finishing up that film and you know we started thinking in the edit room about you know what else we could do uh, with American experience because you know, we like the the experience and um, you know we started thinking and, and, and we started thinking about Emmett Till and I was working with uh, uh, African-American editor uh, Louis Erskine who actually edit, he edited uh, uh, Freedom Riders also um, and so we, we were thinking about, you know, what to do. And, and I said, what about Emmett Till? And he talked about how the murder of Emmett Till kind of changed his life. And I realized that it, it also was very important to me. And, and, you know, I started looking into it just very quickly. And, and I realized that, um, you know, Emmett Till died in 1955, I think it was. And so, you know, and at that point I was four years old. So I, I, I thought I had, I thought I remembered it, but I didn't, you know, 
and Lewis said the same thing that he thought he he had remembered it, but he's even a few years younger than me. So he, you know, so it was this 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 amazing event that that we kind of meant a lot to all of us. Um, the story of Emmett Till was, you know, Emmett Till was was a, a fourteen year old boy from Chicago who went to visit his uncle in in Mississippi, a place called a little town called Money, Mississippi, and um, you know. His mother told him, you know, you got to be careful when you go down to Mississippi. He was from Chicago. And, um, you know, him, him and his friends down in Mississippi are hanging out. And, and um, uh, this white woman comes into the store and, and, you know, nobody knows really what happened. You know, his, his friends say that he actually did whistle at her. You know, um, you know uh, other people say he didn't whistle, but I don't think it matters one way or the other. But, um, you know, later that night, uh, the woman's husband and her and uh, his uncle came in and pulled Emmett out of the house and, and murdered him. And uh, his body was found in the Tallahatchie River uh, a few days later. Um, and, and the big thing about it was his mother had the body brought back to Chicago and they had an open casket funeral. And it was just um, this uh, seminal event for for especially African-Americans all over the country because um, Jet Magazine published pictures of, of Emmett Till and, and you know, the, the, the corrupted body of, of this young boy. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, it was one of the things that, that kicked off uh, the civil rights movement. You know, it's, 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 it's a lot more complicated and, and an amazing story than, than that. Um, the two men who murdered Emmett Till were, were, were actually put on trial, which was amazing in Mississippi. They were put on trial and they were acquitted. And after they were acquitted, they did, made, did an article for Look Magazine where they admitted killing him. Um, and they were never brought to trial again um, because of what's called you know d double jeopardy. But there were ways that they could have been brought to trial, but Mississippi wasn't going to do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the quick story of, of the murder of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. So this this clip that we're about to show, we're going to hear from from Mamie Till. Um, so we'll play the clip and then we'll talk about it some more on, on the other side. No one ever did time for the killing of the 14-year-old black boy from Chicago. But his murder and the trial and acquittal of his killers sent a powerful message. If change was going to come, people would have to put themselves on the line. Contributions to civil rights groups soared. And 100 days after the death of Emmett Till, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white person, and the Montgomery bus boycott began. When people saw what had happened to my son, men stood up who had never stood up before. People became vocal who had never vocalized before. Emmett's death was the opening of the civil rights movement. He was the sacrificial lamb of the movement. Okay, so Stanley, I know that you can't see the the clip that that we played, but one of one of the things that's uh, that just struck me so much in watching this clip in preparation for this discussion, there's a soundbite of Mamie Till Mobley saying that after uh, seeing these images of her son and and as you said, his corrupted body. Um, she says men stood up who had never stood up before people were vocal who had never been vocal before. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what this image of Emmett, of Emmett Till did and how, as you said, that galvanized the movement in, in such a remarkable way? Yeah, I mean, you know, y y you have to understand the image, you know. Um, uh, so many people have seen it. One of the things that Jet Magazine has done was every every year on the anniversary, they they republish the, the the picture of him until but his body had been in the water for days and so it was bloated and 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 it was just horrible and and what had been done to this 14 year old boy was was you know um, 
you know, there was no, no, no possible excuse for it. So, uh, you know, it, it just, and Mamie, you know, in, in all her bravery, you know, buried him with an open ca casket funeral, you know, um, and, and also the, because it was that she had the body shipped back to Chicago, you know, the, the lines to view this, this murdered boy, you know, stretched around the block and, and, you know, there's footage, you know, of, of women actually fainting, you know, just, just falling out. They look at the coffin and just fall out. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, just hundreds of, of black people that, you know, file into the, the church and, and, and go and look at the body and, and, uh, you know, it, it made, uh, African-American people, uh, as someone says in the film, you know, uh, understand what, you know, we were up against and, and it, it brought, it was, you know, the personification of, 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 of what was going on, you know, in, in this country. So it, it was a very, very meaningful piece, you know, um, in, in the civil rights movement and, and laying the foundation. One of the things that, that we found was that you know, Emmett Till was 14. Um, and, and so for, for young black people all over the country who are around that age, okay, these people were around 14, 15, 13, and this is 1955. These are the people who in 61 with the Freedom Rides, you know, 62, you know, uh, with Freedom Summer, you know, who were the core of, of this, the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, you know, uh, people who, young people who are his age and realize that, you know, um, they could be murdered at, at, at any time. It, it's really interesting because I think one of the things that, that, that I've seen, because I have 21 year old kids, is that, you know, um, young people and they are really affected by these kind of things. In a, in a different way. So, so my children who are 21, I have 21 year old twins and a 30 year old, you know, they're really, they're affected by, you know, the murder of George Floyd and some of the things that happened in this country. I'm not saying we all are, aren't, you know, we all are affected, but I think the way that it affects them and, and, and realizing that they're vulnerable and this is the world that, that, that they're just kind of coming to to life in, you know, and, and it really affects them. And it affected this generation uh, who, who, who were young at the time that Emmett Till was murdered. So you brought up George Floyd and the, the horrific murder of, of George Floyd, which, which is another, uh, I, I almost hate to use this word iconic, but just one of those images that's once you see it, it's seared in your brain. You cannot forget it. It's so horrible that it just, you, you can't unsee it. Um, how, how do you think about the way that images are, are shown in news media when it comes to these kinds of stories? Um, I mean, I, I think one of the, you know, the images are incredibly important. I mean, Emmett, the reason why Emmett Till took on the importance that it did was one, because Mamie left the coffin open, but two, because Johnson Publications with Jet Magazine published those photos and, and let people know. You know, Emmett Till was, was not the first by any means young person or person who was murdered, you know, lynched, you know, in, in the South. Um, but what, but what, what, what happened before that is the newspapers in the South, the white newspapers didn't cover it. You know, um, the black newspapers had a very limited scope, you know, um, these were local papers, but this became a national story, and 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 Emmett Till became a symbol of 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 the South. And I think the the other thing that happened, you know, was when um, the two guys go on trial for for the murder. Um, you know, the the Northern press flocked down to the South to cover this trial, and we talked to some of those reporters there in the film, and they were just shocked. Because the, the the courtroom looked like something out of To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, you know the fans are going, all, you know, and 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 the defendants are drinking coke cokes out of a you know the bottle, and it's just it's just crazy, and you know, um, you know, slapping, you know, and hugging their their relatives, um, and, and the 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 reporters, you know, the white reporters who aren't from there are shocked that that this is the South and this is the way it, it really is. So, you know, and, and so it, it exposed kind of this, this, this other side of America that, that, that wasn't talked about, you know, um, you know in, in any real terms. 
And, and again, it's so interesting in this spring what we've what we've all been experiencing with with the with the killing of George Floyd. Um, we have Emmett Till all those decades ago. We have unfortunately countless crimes that have happened since then until now. And yet we still have people saying, I didn't know it was this bad, or I can't believe something like that happened. And so with your experience working on Emmett Till, your experience seeing George Floyd and your experience just living in America, um, how did you how did you react when when you heard people saying we just didn't know it was that bad? Um, you know, I I, th I think I, I I think none of us. You know, I mean, I, I can't say, oh yeah, I, I I knew it was that bad. I mean, you know, I I you know it, it, it's kind of like you, you know as African American, you keep getting slapped in the face by you know you know how bad how bad thing things really are. You know. Um, you know, and and you think, okay, you know, um, but I, I I do think that that you know the political situation in this country has has made everything worse, you know, and and, and made you know, um, uh, you know, just the, these things, you know, you know, it, it's made racism, you know, you know, more acceptable in a lot of ways to a lot of people, and made racist acts, you know, um, you know, more the norm. Um, so I think that that's also part of it. Can't hear you. Sorry, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but um, in the face of what we're living through now, uh, in the face of the history that, that you've documented, um, what do you think your role is as, as a filmmaker, as a documentarian? Um, I, I think you know my 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 role is 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 to try to you know tell the truth to try to you know um, uh, make well researched you know accurate stories to make you know stories that you know um, are entertaining. I mean you know that's that's something that 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 you know we don't like to talk about you know because you know I, you know I want to be a serious filmmaker you know we all want to do but you know you have to make films that are entertaining. You have to make stories that people want to watch, you know, you have to figure out how to do that. Um, part of my, what I try to do is, is like get out of, out of the way and, and tell the story in, in, in the most entertaining artistic way I can, but it's kind of, you know, back up. I don't want, the film is not about me. You know, this is, film is about the murder of Emmett Till. It's not about Stanley Nelson, what Stanley Nelson thinks about the murder of Emmett Till, or at least that's what we're, we're trying to project. You know, that, that's what we want you to leave. I want you to leave the theater thinking that, you know, this is a story about the murder of Emmett Till um, and you're moved by it and that, you know, that you're, you're entertained by it. And I, 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 I you know, I, I want the audience to be, you know, engaged every step of the way mm -hmm. and that's important you know to to how do you engage the audience you know like for every every moment of the film and so there's not this kind of you know up and down but but that they're they're engaged and they're, and they're with you and that they're they're discovering you know uh part of the story i can i can tell you a little some funny thing that that that, that that's an example of that you know um one of the things you know, that when the guys who murdered him until, you know, admitted and, and they actually wrote this article in Look Magazine, this guy interviewed them and they talked about the murder and they said, yeah, you know, he was wearing a, a, a crepe sole shoes, right? And, and, oh, and we burned his clothes, but you know how hard those shoes are to, to, uh, to burn? You know, that crepe it does, just doesn't burn. And so we knew that going in because we read the thing and we found a classmate of, of Emmett Till's in, in Chicago. And she talked about how the women wore pleated skirts and the men wore, wore you know, tight pants or something. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and I said, well, did they wear crepe sole shoes? And she said, yeah. And, and I said, well, tell me that. And she said, and, they, and, and the young men wore crepe sole shoes. And so early in the film, she tells that story and she says, and they wore, you know, pleated skirts and crepe sole shoes and blah, 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 blah. And then later on in the film, when they talk about the murder, they say, 
and, and he had crepe sole shoes. Now we, in the film, we never say anything else about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happens as an audience is like, you discover that, you know, or you feel like you've discovered, oh, I, you know, I remember earlier that they wore crepe sole shoes and now these guys are talking about how hard they are to burn, you know? Mm -hmm. and, that's, and we just let that moment be that moment. And, and you know, that's, that's a, you know, a moment where the audience feels like, you know, they're discovering something and they're part of the story. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about those, those amazing moments of discovery um, while you're in the process of, of putting a film together? Um, I think sometimes people think that well, sometimes you do, you go into a documentary, clearly you have a thesis, you know what it is, this, you know the story that you're trying to tell. Um, but then there are also times where you are finding out things things along the way and, and there are things that you did not expect that suddenly take on more importance for you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know, uh, documentary for for me as a filmmaker is always just discovering stuff and and that's kind of how you know you're on the right track when stuff starts falling just in out of the sky or just falling into place the woman that i'm talking about who who knew emma till and talked about the clothes we were we were actually the first day we were this is our first day of filming and it was really creepy because we were filming in the in the funeral home in chicago that he was brought to and and you know and so we're Filming the, so the guy who actually you know was was there the undertaker was there who accepted his body um, you know we found and we we're interviewing him in 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 the in the funeral home and we break to go to lunch and we're and the receptionist you know is, is says um, she's an older woman she says oh what are you guys doing we're making a film about Emmett Till she's oh yeah he was in my class in school we're like what we're like yeah he was, he, was, he was in my class. And we said, okay, can we interview you after lunch? And she says, yeah. And she tells us, the, you know, the story about the clothes and the crepe sole shoes. She also tells us like what kind of person Emmett Till was that you never got anywhere else. You know, she was like, he was a jokester, you know, he just liked to make jokes and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. And it, it, it was one of those crazy discoveries, you know, and she, she helps you understand why he might be this kind of 14 year old kid who goes down to Mississippi, who doesn't believe, you know, when people say, you know, you got to watch how you act there. He's from Chicago. He's like, ah, you know, and, and why he might, you know, whistle at a white woman because he thought it was funny, you know? Um, so it's, it's those kind of dis discoveries that, you know, along the way um, just, you know, make the film that much deeper and that much richer. When you were making the film, um, or when you were making this film, did you know how important it was going to be? And did you have any aspirations for how it would be received? I mean, obviously, yes, you hope that it's well received, but um, did, were you thinking, okay, I, I really have to focus on these details because this is, this is the definitive story on Emmett Till and there are generations who will come up who don't know this story and need to know this story. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, in, in, in most of the films that, I mean, I'm thinking that in a way, you know, I'm wanting to do the story justice, you know, uh, I'm wanting to do all the things that we talked about before, you know, but um, I try not to think of the word definitive, you know, because it just means, you know, it, 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 it seems like, you know, definitive is like, stuck in molasses somewhere, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm making the definitive film, and, you know, and, you know, I, we try to, you know, one of the, I try to do it in, in, in all of the films is, you know, is have some humor in them, believe it or not, you know, um, because I think that, you know, these are very serious subjects. And so one of the things that we do in editing is anything, anytime we have somebody say something that's kind of funny, you know, we, we, we keep it in until the last moment, you know, those are the, that's the final cut. Okay. We got to take this out, but we try to make those things work, you know? Um, but, you know, I, I think that part of it is that, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that I'm making, you know, the, the, you know, the only film about Emmett Till or the only film about 
Freedom Riders or the only film about Miles Davis or, 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 or whatever, you know, trying to, I'm just trying to tell the story right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying not to make that be a burden that makes me tell the story in any one way. You know, I don't want to be too serious. I don't want to be too definitive, but I'm trying to, you know, I, 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 I know that this might be the only, only film on that subject, you know, for a long while. This, this idea that you don't want to have this burden, um, do you feel like it is inevitable as a filmmaker of color telling these stories that there is a burden or an undue burden on, on you and on other filmmakers of color? No, I mean, I, I, I think that, that as, a, as a filmmaker, you, you know, if you wanna put that burden on yourself, you can, but that's, you know, that's your problem. You know, I think you want, you want to try to get away from that. You know, look, I mean, I, you know, the way, the way I make films and, and what I'm doing, you know, it's just the way I make films. I mean, there's a, a, a lot of other ways to make them. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you can make a, a first person, you know, film about, you know, the murder of Emmett Till. You know, I remember when I was a young boy and I first saw the story, you know, you know there's a, a million ways you can, you can make the, the same story. So I, you know, I, I think that the burden or, or that you put on yourself is, is what you put on, on, on yourself to, you know, um, but I, I look at it as, as a gift. I mean, you know, that, that I, that I am able to make these stories that are really important to me, you know, and, you know, I, if they're, I, you know, they're, I think they're really important stories, you know, and, and not only important stories for black folks, these are important stories for, for white folks. These are for, um, it, important stories for the world, you know, they're, they're, that's how I look at it, you know, like these are great, great stories that, 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 that we should know. And, um, you know, we've been, able, we've been very lucky that, that, you know, a lot of the stories have like these really kind of intricate ins and outs and, and, you know, um, you know, kind of roller coaster ride through these, these stories that, that, that make them uh, kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move forward um, to the next film that we're mm -hmm. going to talk about, Freedom Riders. Can you set up Freedom Riders for us? Yeah, Fre Freedom Riders um, uh, took place in uh, 1961, I believe. 1961, the Freedom Riders. Um, and, you know, this was at the beginning of the civil rights movement. And there was this there was this thought among, you know, leaders of the civil rights movement, you know, Martin Luther King and others, that you couldn't go into the deep south. Right. You know, you could keep it in what's, you know, what they call the upper south, you know, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, maybe, you know, like those kind of places, you know, but but you could not go, you know, to, to Mississippi, Alabama. You know, maybe you could go to Atlanta, but you couldn't go to the rest of Georgia. You know, it wasn't time yet. And, and um, you know, th this this group of, of people led by the, the organization CORE said, you know, we're, we're just going to, you know, we're going we're gonna to get on, on Greyhound buses and Trailways buses. There were 13 of them originally, six on one, seven on the other. And we're just and, and you know, they they had segregated buses. And, and once they hit, you know, the Mason-Dixon line, then, you know, the black people had to sit in the back, white people in the front. But that was already illegal. It was illegal to do that, but the bus, bus companies were still doing that. Um, and so they said, we're just going to get on and we're not going to move. And the white, you know, uh, the white people and the black people will sit together, you know, in the front of the bus or wherever they want on the bus. And we'll just go down. And, and they, they go down. And from D.C., they get on uh, six on a trailway, seven on a Greyhound, the other way around, I don't remember. But they just go down. They have no protection. The only news that the only uh, uh, news that's with them is the black press. They had, there were two reporters from from black black newspapers, but that's it. And they just go down and, you know, they, they were trying to get to uh, they're going to go through the south, through Georgia, through Alabama, through Mississippi and end up in New Orleans. Uh, for those who haven't seen the film, see it. They didn't make it. <laughs> they didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're we're going to play a clip, and then on the other side of that, we'll we'll continue talking about Freedom Riders. 
The idea of the Freedom Rides is a really radical idea. The idea of going into Mississippi and going into Alabama and challenging segregation so frontally and so aggressively in many ways is something that alarmed not only those who oppose civil rights, but those within the, the civil rights community. They thought it was too confrontational, uh, it, that it was uh, going to backfire, it was going to set the movement back. Uh, it was too risky. Core just didn't have the resources or the skill uh, or the really the, the know-how about uh, the inner workings of Jim Crow and racism and how to fight it in the Deep South. And that was very likely that they would get arrested, they might get beaten up, they might even get killed. May I have a cup of coffee, please? Now, look, I don't want any niggers in here. I don't care. Nigger, what are you doing in here? Don't you know? The training that we did in Washington, D.C., prior to the time the, by the writers got on the buses, was largely devoted to trying to see how the person is going to react. Are you with this fella? Why, yes, we're both interstate uh, bus passengers. Where are you from? I'm from the United States. By using nonviolence, people see the contrast between your dignified, disciplined confrontation of the wrong and then the reaction of violence. No way of confusing that confrontation. To move? No, I don't move when I'm in the right. Well done, we'll, we'll The Freedom Rides, I think, typified one of the standard contradictions within the civil rights movement. On the one hand, it's nonviolent, doesn't hit back when hit. On the other hand, they're really courting violence in order to attract publicity that will forward the cause. And so you have these mixed motives. Let's hope nothing happens, nobody's hurt. On the other hand, suppose something does happen, wouldn't that, in an ironic way, be good for us? Get out. Move out. This is a, this Move is, out. This is People at CORE thought maybe some bad things will happen, but I don't think they imagine anywhere near the kind of level of violence that they'd meet in Anniston and Birmingham and in Montgomery. It was make-believe, and it did not scare me, perhaps, because it was make-believe, and I wasn't sure I'd really have to use all these techniques. With our nonviolent behavior and our goodwill, I thought we could do anything. Do you expect any trouble? There is a possibility that we will not be served at some stops. There is a possibility that we might be arrested. This is the only trouble that I anticipate. I'm taking a trip on the Greyhound bus line. I'm riding the front seat to New Orleans this time. Hallelujah, I'm a traveling. Hallelujah, ain't it fine? Hallelujah, I'm a traveling down freedom's main line. The first day getting on the bus, it was a good feeling. It was a good feeling. We were together, it was comradeship, it was a good cause. And we were going for the movement, you know, and we were going for the people. Boarding that Greyhound bus to travel through the heart of the Deep South, I felt good. I felt happy. I felt liberated. I was like a soldier in a nonviolent army. I was ready. So Stanley, right, right before we went into the clip, you talked about how what was so um, interesting, amazing novel about the Freedom Rides is that, and the, and the writers, was that they were going, they were planning to go farther south than people had had before. One of the other really amazing things that we, that we see and that we learn about in this clip is that there were a lot of people who thought that what they were doing was too risky, um, too provocative, and almost courting violence. Can, can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, again, they, they they were doing something that that the you know traditional civil rights movement had not done yet, which was going into the deep, deep, deep South. And you know, um, it, what what happens after this, you know, piece is you know is that you know Martin Luther King and, and others basically tell them they're you know no, you know, if if I were you, I wouldn't keep going. 
um, you know, um, and in, in some ways, you know, they 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 might have been a bit naive. That first group of freedom riders, you know, they, you know, they, you know, and and kind of zealots, you know, um, you know. In the other thing that the, the, there's the piece in there um, where um, someone says, you know, um, but that's part of, of 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 what they wanted, you know, they they wanted this kind of confrontation. They 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 were almost you know, they didn't want violence to happen, but in some ways they needed something to happen to put them on the map. And so it's a, it's a very interesting strategy. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I love, I love that clip that's in the film because it, it, you know, it, it lays that, that bear, something that, that, you know, people kind of talk around, but, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, we don't really want violence, but, but we almost need it for this thing to succeed. So I have, I have a question from, from our audience on Facebook. Someone asked, when choosing to include violent images or footage, how do you gauge how much to use and for how long do you worry about traumatizing the audience? So we're talking about Freedom Riders. They're, in some ways, they're courting the violence because they know how powerful that but image is going to the be. The example of that it would be Emmett Till, you know, because there's the, the image of him in, in um, in Jet Magazine, you know, and they, you know, it was an image of of, of his his body that you know, it, you know, it's horrible. Um, and we, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, how much how much to show. His mother in the film, Mamie Till, describes, you know, she describes she she tells the story of going into the funeral home and seeing his body, um, and and you know, she she I mean, she describes it in vivid detail that she looked, started at his feet and then, you know, kind of, you know, looked up his body and she describes it. Um, and so, you know, we, we cut that scene and one of the things that we did because we couldn't judge it anymore, you know, we would call in the mailman or the, or, or the, or the mailwoman or, or the FedEx guy would be making a delivery. We'd say, okay, could, could you just come in and watch this scene? <laughs> just, 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 okay, is that too much? What do you think? And, you know, and, and and you know we had if other. They didn't people, faint. It was fine. Right? So we had other people watch because you know at, at some point you know you, you kind of grow in, in, insensitive to to that stuff. Um, you know because you've seen it so many times. But you know it was really important for us to show to show you you know what people were fainting about and what 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 what, what you know incensed so much of the country. We we could not show it. Um, but we also didn't want it to be gratuitous. We didn't want you know you, you you to kind of get you know pissed off at us, which which would happen if if we showed you too much. So yeah, I mean those those things are are, are always you know th things that, that that you think about, um, you know. But frankly, you know um, the you know that happened in Emmett Till in in most of these th scenes, you know, especially from from that era. You know the violence. You don't really exactly see it. You know, it's not. It's not like there's someone there with a phone camera. You know, showing this cop. You know, you know, putting his his knee on this guy's neck for eight and a half minutes. You know, that's not. That's not what's there. So, um, you know, it, it's very different. So, so uh, most of the time, you don't have that problem. You know, with, with historical docs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. Can you talk a little bit about how the protesters themselves were perceived by by the country at that time? Again, we're they're they're worried. Some of the, the older leaders are afraid that they're going to be perceived as rabble rousers or provocateurs. There are other people who are like they're freedom fighters. Clearly, they're doing something to help all of us. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the most amazing things, you know, about Freedom Riders, especially for for us, for me as a filmmaker and for us making the film, is there was no perception of the first group because there was no press. I mean, there was there was nobody. Nobody was covering. I mean, these are thirteen people. Seven of them get on one bus. Six of them get on the other in D.C. and they just start riding on the bus. These aren't special buses. These are like, you know, can I get a ticket to Mississippi, please? You know, uh, you know, can I get it? You know, and they just were, were riding. And, and the only press, again, that, that was with them, there were two reporters from black newspapers. 
And that was it. And so, so, you know, there was no perception of them at all. You know, once the violence starts happening, um, when they get to Alabama, then the press starts covering them. And, and, and so, you know, then, you know, I mean, they were, they were looked at as, as, you know, in, in, you know, incredibly brave, um, by, by, by most, by most people, incredibly stupid by some other people, you know, I mean, the South looked at them like, well, well what do you think was going to happen? You know, but again, you know, I mean, what's really important though is that we understand that, that all they were doing was sitting next to each other on a bus. That's all they were doing. You know, and, 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 you know, one of the buses was firebombed, you know, I mean, you know, they were, they were beaten, you know, we could, you know, I don't want to blow the film for those who haven't seen it, but you have to have to see the film, but, but, you know, um, and, and, and after that, you know, the press now was following it because the violence was there because there was something there to follow. And now the press floods in. There's these great shots of the, where, where the bus is firebombed uh, outside of Anniston, Alabama, that are incredible. I mean, they're incredible. And one of the things that that uh, people down there told us, you know, um, they they said, well, well, you know, the guy who took those pictures, he he was a photographer for for the paper here, but he was Italian, and he wasn't from here. That's why, you know, so, so they were like, you know, look, uh, uh, any, any Southerner worth his salt would not have even taken those pictures. But this guy didn't know the kind of, you know, those, well, he was just a photographer. And he was like, okay, well, they're burning the bus. I'm gonna take the pictures. And so he took these incredible series. I mean, they're incredible series of photos of, of the bus being torched and, and, and burned. I want to, uh, because you said you don't want to spoil the film, I just want to remind everyone that these three titles that we're talking about, these three films, are available to, to stream in full at AmericanExperience.org. So if you have not seen them, or if you just, if you've seen them but haven't seen them in a long time, please go to our site and, and, and watch them. Uh, I have another question for you from the audience on Facebook. Have the black have the recent Black Lives Matters Matter protests inspired you to consider telling the history of any specific moments that you think have renewed importance for today's national conversation? Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on, on on a number of of, of things. I don't, I'm not sure what the question means. If they're talking about historical stories or or, or present day stories. Um, you know, um, we're working on a film about Tulsa, you know, the, the Tulsa massacres um, that, that we're just starting um, and a bunch of, bunch of other things. Um, uh, I'm not working on a, a film about, you know, uh, George Floyd and, and what's happening right now. I mean, I think that, that you know, they're, they're, look, there's every, everybody I, I saw marching, it looked like they had their phone up and was filming. So, you know, there's gonna be a bunch of, uh, um, of films about, about that and, and about, you know, what happened. And I, I know, you know, people who are out there with their cameras shooting and stuff like that. So, so they'll be I mean, out there. We're actually developing a project on police and the history of, of African-Americans and, 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 and the police, because I think that's really important that we understand that this is not something new, that this is what the police were created to do. They were created to keep black people in their place. They were not created to protect and serve black people. That's, you know, and, and that's just the history of it. And, and, you know, and so we're working on a, a film that, that um, developing a film that, that will talk about that, that, that long contentious history of African-Americans in the police. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another question from Facebook. In your Lifetime Achievement Award acceptance speech in 2016, you challenged the audience to step outside your comfort zone and to hire people, hire people who don't look like you. In 2020, has the media landscape improved for people of color in positions to make media and tell diverse stories? Um, I think it's improved. I, I think it's, you know, it, it hasn't nearly gone to where it needs to go. You know, um, you know, um, but it, it's I mean, I think one of the th interesting things about George Floyd is is it's made 
people who are aware, you know, and, and you know, by general, uh, by definition, you know, people in the media are, are kind of, you know, uh, aware of what's going on. It's made people look around, you know, in a way that they never did before and say, whoa, wait a minute, you know, and, and so, you know, um, you know, people are, 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 are being hired, you know, in, in uh, leadership positions, you know, but, you know, these are people who should have been hired a long time ago. You know, and leader. I mean, it's not like they're hiring some some unqualified person, you know. But but I think I think you know for the moment. I mean, and, and that's what you know. I, I you know I don't know what white people talk about because I not you know in a group of, of white people. But I'm a group black people. Black people all talk about well, how long is this going to last? You know, that's what black people talk about constantly. You know, okay, they you know the people people are, are are very caring and 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 kind of you know looking around and saying, oh my God, there's no black people here, you know. Um, you know, uh, and 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 they're also looking at, at at you know other. Well, there's no, you know, wait, there's no women here either. <laughs> there's there's nobody Latino Latinx here either. Wait, wait, you know, wait, wait, wait. You know, <laughs> there's nobody gay here. You know, I mean, all these things are you know, our people are, are sorry, sorry, look around. But who knows, you know, how long that's going to last? You know, and, and that's something that, that 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 at least you know among people, I know everybody talks about. It. But yeah, I mean, I think that 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 things there's there's a slight improvement um but you know in the, look i mean this country is is, is going to be so much better when when people all people tell tell their stories you know and people tell their own stories you know people people are able to dive down you know deeper into the stories because you know the, the stories are you know are coming out out, out of their, their 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 own culture you know when, when we made Emmett Till, you know, we were at, we went, we were, went to Sundance with the film and, you know, th th this white filmmaker, you know, uh, you know, on the cheese line or some, some part, he said, oh man, I, I'm glad you made that film because I, I wish I could have made it. I really wanted to make that film. Uh, you know, what, 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 what does his Emmett Till film look like? You know, Emmett Till did not, the images of Emmett Till did not stick with him all his life like it did for me, like it did for Lewis Erskine, like it did for other people involved in that film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I know what you're going to say, but um, should non, should filmmakers who are not of color be making these stories too? No. <laughs> I don't think so. No. You know, I mean, look, everybody's always like equivocating. Well, blah, blah. No, I mean, no. You know, I mean, I'm not going to make a story about, you know, a Jewish cantor or somebody like that. I mean, why would I, you know, like, what? You know, no. You know, I mean, make stories about, about your own communities. I mean, you know, you guys are the, are, are, you guys are the only ones who can talk to, you know, those, the, those, those racist cops, right? You guys can go, you know, and, 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 and talk to, you know, people that, that, that I can't, you know, talk to, you know, and you have your own stories. It's so amazing how many people, you know, like, why do white folks constantly want to make stories, uh, you know, about people of color? You know, they have their own stories, you know, and, and we need those stories. We need to hear those stories because I don't understand. I, you know, like, I'm like, what? You know, and I, 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 I want to, uh, you know, like what's going on, you know? So anyway, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I, th I think, I think at this point, you know, we've, we've, we've gone down that road, you know, and that's, and also that's what, <laughs> that, that's to me, you know, is, is, is one really, you know, good example of white privilege. You know, when people talk about white privilege, that's what white privilege is, you know, like, like I, I am a blank slate. I come in there, I don't have any bias. I'm just, you know, I'm white. I'm, I'm like white and I don't have, you know, I can make a film about anything I want, you know. But also, you know, look, you have white, white folks have, you know, uh, access to the power, you know, access <laughs> to, you know, resources, um, you know, and, you know, um, you know, so I, I, I think, I think, I think it's time that, you know, um, uh, you know, white filmmakers need to make a film about white folks. So I know that we have to get to our clip on Freedom Summer, but I feel like this is a, a really good point for me to ask you about Firelight Films and the goal that um, 
that you and Marsha set out with when when you founded when you founded it? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, look, we, we just we, we found Five Films, which is like twenty years ago now. You know, we were we we. We we started out as a Firelight Media. It was a nonprofit company. We were we were going to make films. You know that that's what we do. I was already I had already been making films for twenty years or whatever it was. You know, maybe more. I don't know. But we were you know we were going to you know just 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 make films and and you know then we we started finding that that you know um, you know we were being asked to mentor filmmakers. You know, were coming to us and 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 we found that 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 all filmmakers are asked to do that. But filmmakers of color are asked to do that, you know, more than other filmmakers. So, you know, um, you know, I, I mean, I literally, you know, would have, you know, fil black filmmakers call me up, you know, say, you know, that I didn't know, you know, I'm getting out of college, you know, you know, in two weeks, can I, you know, come work with you or can I come talk to you? And, you know, and talking to other filmmakers, you know, of, of color, you know, they were having the same thing. And, and so we started, uh, we kind of split off. So Firelight Films does the production of Firelight Media as a nonprofit. And our main thing is this is documentary lab, which is in its 11th year. I think we have, we have like 100 people who have graduated and we've won um, every award except the Academy Award, but we're working on that. Um, you are. You know, but you know, we won a, a Sundance, a Sundance Award this year. We've won other awards at Sundance, you know, and Emmys and Peabody's and all those things, you know, and these are, you know, filmmakers who are making their first or second film. And our mission is to help them, you know, um, get that first or second film made. As we say, our mission is to get them, you know, that, that first, second film out under their belt and have, you know, people be able to, you know, buy their groceries and pay their rent from making films and to get a whole new cadre of filmmakers out there. And, you know, we're, we're really proud of that, that it's been working. We just started another program, the William Greaves Fund, which is to help filmmakers make, you know, their second or third film. It's kind of more for mid-career filmmakers. And so we're working on that. And, and um, you know, um, you know, we're trying to change the industry one step at a time in, in our little way, in whatever way, way, way we can. Because, you know, people have stories to tell. and, and and they're good at it, you know. I mean, that's the thing that that amazed me that we found we got just great filmmakers, you know. Um, so you know, it, it's really exciting. Look, when you know you're working with a filmmaker and they're made, making their first film, and it's going to Sundance, you know, it's like, you know, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're 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 doing it, and and uh, we all need to catch up. Yeah. We all need to catch up. Yes. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to Freedom Summer because um, time is running short. Tell tell us about Freedom Summer. Uh, Freedom Summer um, was I forget the year, sorry, but you know a year or so after uh, Freedom Riders, and um, it was uh, you know the 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 plan was to kind of you know flood the South with with young college students, you know, white and black, who would volunteer to go into the South, uh, into Mississippi, I believe it was mainly Mississippi, and, and register people to vote, you know, and, and, and it was a simple plan, you know, we're gonna go down there and we're gonna just, you know, register people to vote. And, and, and again, it was one of those things where they knew that, you know, if they, if they brought white college students down there, that, that the media would follow and that, that there would be, a, uh, you know, um, attention on them. Um, what happened was they were in a, they were they were in a training session, so they were all trained in uh, at a university in Ohio, and they went there for training, kind of like the training that you saw in um, Freedom Riders. So they went there for for training, and two or three of them had to leave early um, to to get back down south for something, and those three. Um, and the, the program hadn't even started. Those three disappeared and, and later were found that they, they had been murdered. Um, and um, I think the scene you're gonna see is, is, is the eulogy for um, James Cheney, who, who actually was African-American and was from that, from that era, area. And so he, he, he was, even though he was part of Freedom Summer, he was actually from there. Um, and he and 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 two white guys uh, who were with him, uh, uh, Schwerner and Goodman, were were 
were were murdered um, before before it even started. So we're we're going to roll that clip that that you just talked about and then talk about it on the other side. Great. In Mississippi, a memorial service was held for James Cheney. The decision had been made by family members and local leaders and others that they want to keep this very quiet um, and then low key rather than that their eulogy. I want to talk about is really what I really grieve about. I don't grieve for Cheney because the fact I feel that he lived a fuller life than many of us will ever live. I feel that. He's gotten his freedom. He was still fighting for it. Dave Dennis's speech was a turning point in the summer because everybody wanted him to say the usual things that you would say at a funeral. And Dave say. Dennis just couldn't do it. He challenged the people at the memorial, and he challenged the whole movement. You see, we all tired. You see, I know what's going to happen. I feel it deep in my heart when they find the people who killed those guys in the Shoba County. All the different emotions and things I've been going through um, leading up to this particular moment began to, to come out, boil up, and we might call this. And then looking out there and seeing Ben Cheney, James Cheney's little brother, I lost it. I totally just lost it. Don't bow down anymore. Hold your heads up. We want our freedom now. I don't want to have to go to another memorial. I'm tired of funerals. Tired of it. I've got to stand up. Uh, so the clip that we just saw, uh, Dave Dennis is giving the eulogy for James Cheney, as you said, and um, such a powerful, such a powerful moment. Um, going into it, people are wanting him to give a very buttoned up, sort of dignified, um, dignified tribute to to his friend, um, and it's like he just gets overcome and needs to speak speak truth um how how what was it like talking to him ab about that moment uh it was incredible i mean you know dave dennis is an incredible human being i mean he's still you know he's still out there fighting you know you know i mean he's still you know he's 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 still fiery and so many of the people who are involved in, in the freedom rides and 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 especially freedom summer because they were so young you know, are still um, out there. You know, um, you know, fighting and 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 pushing for change. So, um, you know, it it was great. Uh, you know, to, I mean, you know, part of this whole thing, you know, for me is, is just talking to these people. That's just so incredibly great. You know, um, one of the things for Freedom Summer and Freedom Riders was we traveled around. You know, at screenings with with Freedom Riders and 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 the people who, were, who participated in Freedom Summer and, you know, we would be on the stage after the film talking and they would be thanking me, you know, for, for making the film. And every single time I would get teared up and I would, I mean, it was embarrassing because I would start crying, you know, because I was like, look, there's no way I would be on this stage as an African-American director if it wasn't for you all risking your lives, you know, and, and I'll, I'll start crying now, you know? I mean, I can't thank you enough, you know, like, thank me, I made a freaking film. You know, you risked your lives and, you know, um, so, you know, it's just, it, it's like th this, 
I don't know. It, it's 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 almost like an out of body experience, but you know, it, it it's to 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 be around the, those people and you know when when we we did freedom we did we did freedom riders and we we went to Sundance and we had a what they call a community screening in Salt Lake City and they bus like bus loads of high school students in there you know bus and you know they're they're ninety five percent white because you know it's it's Utah. And you know, um, a bunch of the freedom freedom riders were there, and um, I left. Bernard Lafayette, who's in the film, and Jim Zwerg, who's in the film, um, were there, and I had to run to another screening or something. And when I left, they were leading these kids in freedom songs, you know, <laughs> like, you know and they were all. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, you know, it was it, so they're just you know amazing, amazing people. One of, one of the questions uh, from the audience was about how you as a filmmaker really lean on, um, on the interviews and, and the voices as opposed to very heavy, heavy narration. Um, wh why, is that, why is that so important? Like, what do we get from these people? Um, right. What's the opportunity there? Okay, uh, just remember that question because I'm going to go off off a little bit. I think that one of the things that, that we learned when we did the murder of Emmett Till, because the film that we did before that was about Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey looked for me in the whirlwind and, and it kind of ended in 1923 or somewhere in there, 25. And we actually found some people who were Garveyites, you know, who were still alive. I mean, this was, I, this was, I, I should say, you know, like uh, we made the film in, in the early nineties, but you know, they were still, we found some Garveyites, but it was hard, you know, and it was hard finding any kind of footage. You know, there's one shot of Marcus, footage of Marcus Garvey. It's like a three second shot of him in a car and he turns his head. But when we made the murder of him until we found that, that there were people alive, there were people that we could talk to, you know, the footage is great, you know, all black and white and, and stuff. And, and people are talking about th th this time in their life that was, that was hugely important. To, and, you know, we, we, I realized that we had kind of struck some gold, you know, that, 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 that there's this, there's this era that, that is just golden. And, and so that, um, you know, it, it really helped us in, in, you know, making Freedom Summer and Freedom Riders. And what was your question again? Well, I kind of feel like you're, you're talking about it. The question from the audience was about um, leaning so heavily on the interviews and letting people speak for themselves. And I, I feel like that's what you're talking about, that, that, that feeling that you struck gold when you find someone who can narrate for themselves. Right. So, so Emmett Till has a narrator, um, you know, and, and, and these films were all made for, for American experience. But um, we, we made a film um, called Jonestown, The Life and Death of People's Temple for, um, for American experience. And I remember, you know, when we were talking about making the film, I remember sitting there and I said, you know, I, I think we can make this film without narration. And they were like, you know, because all their films had narration, like all the films had narration. And we were like, they're going to, you know, like argue about it. And we, he said, we could do this. I think we could do this out there without narration. They were like, yeah, yeah. You know, we were like, great. You know, they, they love the idea. And so, um, you know, pretty much all of our films, pretty much all of our films since then have not. Uh, relied, you know, on, on, on narration. And I think, you know, it just, it just, it, it gives the audience a different feeling because they're part of the film. You don't have somebody, you know, saying, you know, when Emmett Till, you know, or whatever, you know, you, 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 you're being told the story by the people who are involved. It makes it a lot harder to make the film, and we try not to, you know, and and we try to go to where the, in some ways, to where the interview takes us, you know. So the interviews, so you know, we have a script, but you know, we're going off, you know. It's like, you know, it's like if if you say I, I'm gonna, you know, drive from New York to California, and I'm gonna, you know, take, you know, a month to do it, or take that's gonna be my summer vacation. Well, you know, you gotta have a map. Right to get there, but you know, you might be like, "Oh, I'm going to take this side road here." You know, that looks really nice. Or you know, hey, there's a sign there that says, you know, I don't know, a witch's museum. I want to see what the heck that is. You know, so you know, you, you, you know, so we want to be able to 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 go off script, you know, as long as it's part of the story. 
and and uh, you know, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that that I love about so many of your films, um, and particularly in in Freedom Summer, um, it's this this showcase and and this spotlight on everyday Americans, like ordinary Americans who are who put themselves or are put into extraordinary circumstances. Um, how important is it for you to tell stories about quote unquote ordinary people? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that just, you know, for me, it, it, it really appeals, you know, in, in very general terms, you know, it, 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 you know, uh, more than, 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 you know, what's they call the great man, you know, his, you know, uh, theory of history, you know, where there's this great man and, you know, I mean, I, you know, look, Martin Luther King's a great man, but I'm, I, 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 I would, would much rather tell the story of the people who, you know, were from Selma you know, who were there and, and st had to stay there after Martin Luther King left, you know, you know, and, and we're fighting and we're, and we're living under those conditions before he got there, you know, and to me, those are, you know, the, the stories that are, are really uh, important to me. And, and also the stories of movements, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, and the stories of institutions, but, you know, it, it's not like I've ever thought about this before, you know, right? before somebody interviewed me and I was like, yeah, I guess, you know, but, you know, so it, it's the Marcus Garvey movement. It's the Freedom Rides. It's, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, Freedom Summer. It's, you know, Jonestown. It's, it's the movement that, that, that the death of the murder of Emmett Till started. Those are, those are, um, I think for, for whatever reason, what I, my films tend to be about. Stanley, are you an activist? Do you consider yourself an activist? No, I consider myself a filmmaker. You know, no overlap. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to consider me an activist, I, I, I'd be a, a pretty poor activist if, I, <laughs> if, 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 if that's what I am. I mean, you know, I, I'm a filmmaker. You know, um, you know, um, no, I, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, if you, I, I, I have no problem with that if somebody wants to think of me as an activist, but, you know, I, I think my decisions would be, would be different, you know, in, in life if I was, if I was, if I was an, an I, if I feel like an activist, I would spend more of my time activating <laughs> rather than filmmaking. I don't know, but so. Okay. Um. I want to talk about, we're, we're going to get to some more audience questions. Um, I want to talk about the importance of public media. You've, the three films that we're talking about, countless others you've made for, for public media. Uh, why is that important? And, and what, what is the role um, of public media going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to understand the history, you know, for, for me, I mean, when I started making films, which was a long time ago, you know, when I was in film school, so we're talking about like 40 years ago, you know, um, public media was the, was the only, only people who were doing documentaries, you know, this is before HBO, you know, HBO didn't exist, you know, the networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, which were the three networks that existed at that time, they did not hire independent filmmakers. If they wanted to make a film, they sent out their producers and their news people to, to make those films. So, you know, PBS was, was, was the one who was there. Um, you know, and, and I think in, in some ways that that role has changed now that you got Netflix, Hulu, whatever, whatever, whatever. But the different there's there's so many differences. You know, one, you know, their the, their bottom line, you know, is to make money. I mean, that's finally, you know, their bottom line. And and you know that, you know, they they can make good films, they can make bad films, they can do whatever. But they're they're there to make money. The other thing that 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 is really important about you know that, that uh, PBS that that they're very different it is, you know, you know PBS works may, maybe it's because PBS doesn't have you know whatever the billions of dollars that Netflix has, but they they you really work to get your film seen and out there. You work with the communities to get your film out there. You know, also what is it is like PBS is in like ninety eight point seven percent of the households or some craziness like that. So everybody, you know, every you think everybody might have Netflix, but they don't. Everybody might have you know Hulu, but they don't. But everybody, everybody pretty much does have have, have PBS. Also, you know, for for us and our films, you know, they've been. They've been just in, incredible, you know. 
Um, you know, when we did the Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution, you know, we kept we kept saying like, you know, okay, so have you, you know, what do you think? And they're like, oh yeah, it's great. We're like, uh, are they watching this film? Because I, I don't know if they're even looking at it because they were just like, oh yeah, it's just keep going, you know. Um, and and you know, I think they had confidence in you. Yeah, I guess. They're not watching. Yeah, but we were, but you know, we've been able to, you know, um, make. The, the films that 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 we, we want to make. Um, I think we made seven or eight films for with American Experience, and and they were they were they were great partners. I mean, they it was always uh, they helped. You know, as painful as it was sometimes, and I have to admit it was painful. But but they're they they're always trying to make the films better. It was never about ego or you know make it more commercial or you know you know what I mean. Or it was always about you know how how you can make the films. Uh, better and and um, you know they did you know and and uh, we had a, we had a great partnership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna uh, go for one of these other questions. Um, let's see, uh, what are some specific ways media entities, public media or otherwise, can better empower filmmakers of color in telling diverse stories? Um, you know, I, I think one is is, is to have uh, the higher echelons of, of 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 their structure, you know, be people of color, be more diverse. I mean that, you know, that, you know, that 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 that's just the way the way it works. You know, um, you know, um, we we made a film, um, Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution, and and me, uh, we were we were in the edit room and. Um, you know, we had a whole section on on uh, women in the Black Panther Party, and 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 uh, you know, in, in our in our rush to get it out there, and our craziness, you know, me and the editor, who who was another man, you know, we kind of cut it cut it out and cut it way down, and you know, the producer uh, Lorenz Grant, you know, as a woman, you know, you know, <laughs> she said, "What happened to that? You know, that's really important," and we're like, "Yeah, you're." <laughs> You know, you're right, you know, and, and, and she was, I mean, like, that's one of the things that everybody remembers about the film is the whole section on the Panther women. And, you know, it's just really important to have, you know, different voices uh, around, you know. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the things that, 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 you know, has to get done is you have to have, you know, one, you know, different people who are, who are doing the hiring, doing the selecting of the stories, you know that that top level, but you know you also have to have a pipeline. How do you how do you get people you know you know to, to the level where they're you know producing and directing and, and and doing all those and editing, and you just have you know uh, more diverse stories. Um, I'm gonna go to another another audience question. Um, you know, you you talked about uh, how you as as a black filmmaker want to tell black stories, uh, and how you would like to see white film white filmmakers tell white stories because sometimes there's um, there's access there there's an increased level of access that you can get when you look like the person you are interviewing or the main characters of your story. But I will say there are in in these three films, as well as countless others you've made, there are these unbelievable moments where you get people like a white sheriff or, you know, a former FBI agent to say something that's incredible, that is, you know, interview gold. Um, how, how, how do those things happen? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, 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 I think that you know, I I I I wonder myself. So, I mean, I, you know, I think I, I like I like to listen to people talk. You know, especially when I'm filming. Maybe you know, when I'm not filming, I don't really listen too much. But when I'm filming, I like to, to listen to people to people talk. Um, I think that you know, um, it's well we we you know it's well researched. You know, um, you know we we kind of pre-interview people. Um, and, 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 you know, we make notes, you know, um, when we were doing the murder of Emmett Till, one of the, the things that his cousin says, who was in the house when he was 
kidnapped, I, you know, we were doing a pre-interview with no cameras and I asked him, like, well, you know, what was it like? And, you know, he said it was dark as a thousand midnights. Mm. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face and they came to take him until. And so I, I wrote that as a note, you know, I wrote that in quotes and I went back and got him to say it. You know, when, when I got those guys to say, you know, um, you know, they wore crepe sole shoes. You know, I, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I got the woman to, to say that they wore crepe sole shoes because I knew that, that that's what they had said in, the, in, in the, the Look magazine article. So, you know, that's part, part, the part of research. And part of it is just, you know, kind of, you know, just, just luck and, and, and gold, you know, um, you know, I mean, and, and I think, you know, people, people want to talk, you know, every, you know, listen, listen to me for the last hour and a half, you know, talking about myself, you know, people, people like to talk about, about themselves, you know, they do, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, we're talking to people who, who may not have been, you know, asked that, 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 that much, you know, about, about themselves. And, and part of it, you know, is, 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 is 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 you know so sometimes it, 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 it's it's that they haven't been asked sometimes you know with 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 black folks you know it, it's you know they they're telling me something as a black person that they you know um that they wouldn't get a, get a chance to tell you know um when we did the black panthers i mean the moment in, in that film you know the be the the one of the best things moments I've, I've I've ever filmed. You know I'm talking to one of the former Black Panthers. He's talking about the shootout in L.A. and he says, you know, and and I, I you know I said you know they 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 have the shootout with the cops and 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 they've they've fortified the uh, the Panther headquarters. They put sandbags up on the wall so the bullets won't come through and. And the cops come. This is one of the, this is the one of the first no knock warrants that, that's ever been used. They, this is the first time they've ever used a no knock warrant. They just come into there. And part of the Panthers' uh, uh, statements were, were always that you know you just don't let the police you know come in and uh, and harass you. No, they have no right to do that. So they just they don't knock. They they break down the door and the Panthers repel them you know, with guns and, and they go into this long shootout with the cops. And, uh, you know, I, I said to the, to, to one of the Panthers, well, you know, how did you feel? You know, you, you, you're, you're trapped there in this building. You're running out of bullets. You, know, you have no more bullets. They're bringing tanks outside now to, you know, to get in. They, they're, you know, you're up against the whole LA de police department. How did you feel? And he said, I felt free. Mm. Oh, I felt, I felt free. I was making my own rules. I was a black man making my own rules. I felt free. That's how I felt. You know what I mean? And he's talking to me as a black man. You know, he doesn't have to say, after 300 years of oppression, Bob, you know, he doesn't have to explain anything. He's looking me dead in the eye and like, you know what I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, and and that's the, the the moment. So one, you know, look, that wasn't the greatest question in the world, you know, um, but maybe I set him up, you know, to give me that answer. I don't know, but it, you know, it, it it's part of you know just kind of having that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stanley, one of, one of the last questions one of the last audience questions that, that we'll probably take uh, from YouTube. Um, do you feel any urgency in doing some more of these older, more historical pieces because some of the original participants are dying? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's always an, 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 an urgency, you know, if you look at, you know, the range of, you know, I mean, I guess I've been making films for a long time, but, you know, um, you know, you, you, you want to get the stories down, but it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it and saying, okay, you know, let me do a story about 1967 now and let me do a story. About no, I mean, it, it's, you know, um, you know, great stories. As I say, you know, we did Marcus Garvey. I mean, we found people who, who, you know, who could remember Garvey. You know, we found a woman 
who, when Garvey was deported, you know, stood on 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 on, on the dock, and, and could talk about it. She 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 said he. I could remember him on the dock waving his handkerchief as the boat pulled out. And sure enough, there's a picture of him with the handkerchief, you know, waving and as the boat pulls out. So, you know, um, I think there's, you know, there, there, there's always an, an urgency to, to tell stories. Um, but it's not like I'm, you know, trying to say, okay, I got to tell a story about 73 before it, before it, or it's over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what is it about history that is so appealing to you? Like, why this genre? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I always want to say, you know, look, I fell into it. The first film I, I, I made, independent film I made, was a film called Two Dollars and a Dream about Madam C.J. Walker. And, you know, I was like a young filmmaker at the time. And, um, you know, my grandfather <clears throat> was her business partner. And so, you know, I just kind of fell into an F.B. Ransom, you know, as my grandfather, my mother's father. Um, so I just kind of, you know, as a, I was, I, you know, I'm like out there, I'm like, wait a minute, there's a good, <laughs> you know, I was, I mean, I was embarrassed that it took me like, you know, five years as, you know, after I got out of film school to say, oh yeah, there's a, there's a good story. So, and I made that film and, uh, you know, and I was like, okay, well, let me, you know, one of the things I should try to do is another one. And, and so it's kind of, you know, kind of rolled from, from there. Um, but I, I, I found that I like it, you know, it's, 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 I mean, you know, history's kind of, really, you know, amazing, you know, to, you know, to, to look at when I did Two Dollars and a Dream in the Story of uh, uh, Madam, Madam C.J. Walker, you know, we used a lot of uh, black newspapers because, you know, her, she had ads in black newspapers and, you know, stuff like that. And, and so the uh, next film was Soldiers Without Swords, a film about black newspapers, because I just became fascinated with, with black newspapers, you know, that, you know, I would, you know, because we talk about black people, you know, in the 1920s and people want to think, oh, well, you know, all black people were doing whatever, you know, shining shoes or doing manual labor. But, you know, I would look at those papers and I was like, wait a minute, this papers had a black editor, they had black writer, they had a black cartoonist, <laughs> you know, they had black, you know, a typesetter, you know, you know, what about, you know, all, all these people who, who were making, you know, they're living, you know, at these at these black institutions, at these newspapers. And so that's what kind of got me started on on on, on that road. And you know, it was just kind of fascinating to, to think about that there that there's this whole other history that exists that we think about a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stanley, I, I said before that that was probably our last question, and I think that triggered a bunch of people like, wait, wait. So now there are a couple of questions about um, your advice um, to young filmmakers, aspiring documentary filmmakers, particularly filmmakers of color. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, look, if, if you're young, see a lot of docs, you know, see, see a lot of documentaries. I mean, that's a simple thing to do. You know, they're, you know, they're all online, you know. Um, you know, the films we talked about now are, are all available, you know. Um, Emmett Till, Black Press, uh, I mean, Freedom Riders and Freedom Summer are available, so, so are some of the other ones. Um, but other people's films, they're all, all, all around, you know. Just look at films. Um, you know, if, if you're just starting, you know, think about making shorts, you know, see, see some shorts, there's shorts all over, you know, um, you know, op docs from the New York Times, others, you know, there's, there's doc, there's short docs all over, you know, think about making one thing, you know, um, you know, think about, uh, learn, learn how to use the equipment, you know, learn how to shoot, learn how to edit, you know, even if you want to be a, a director, you know, you know, it's simple, you know, you take a camera out and shoot. You know, one of the things that somebody said to me early on, you know, go shoot, shoot a dance performance, you know, because, you know, following dancers is is, is really um, hard to do and, and really interesting. And you learn how to use the camera, you know, and then see what you like, you know, you know, look, but it's not it's not brain surgery. You know, it's like, you know, you know, everybody, every, you know, like, look, you may you've never seen anybody operate on somebody's brain, probably. I if you know but you've seen a lot of films you know whoever you are you've seen a ton of films you know what a film looks like you know you know and be critical of yourself you know you know start making a make a short you know make you know and you can make anything you know like you make of 
five minute film about the bodega. You can make a five, you know, minute film about, you know, like in New York or other places where those people walk around the street and, and collect bottles, you know, which I think is like an amazing thing, you know, like to do that. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna rob somebody. I'm not gonna commit a crime. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go, and all night I'm gonna go collect bottles, you know, you know, like, you know, and like in, in New York, there are people and these there's families of people who do this, you know, they're not, you know, um alcoholics or on drugs, it's just what they do. You know, but there's a million things that you 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 could do it and you know, just just go for it. And again, you know, when I when I when I came up, you couldn't you couldn't see an old film unless you went to a, a art house movie theater or they played an old movie on TV or or they showed it at your film school. You know, now I could I could name almost any film and you can pull it up on your phone or your computer in 30 seconds and and and, and watch it. And so, you know, and 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 then the big, the big thing is 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 figure out if you like doing it, you know? Cuz you know, my life my life is not doing interviews and and you know, winning awards. My you know, it's it's just it's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sage advice. Sage advice. Stanley, thank you so much for spending this time with us tonight. Um, personally, I must say I am desperately looking forward to your next American Experience film. I hope that there will be many more to come. Um, but it was really just a pleasure to, to talk to you tonight. Um, I thank you, our teams thank you, and we just really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, really appreciate it. Yeah. So. To all of you out there, thank you again for joining us tonight for this important and timely conversation. A special thanks to the World Channel for partnering with us for this event. All three films that we discussed tonight are available to stream in full on AmericanExperience.org. And please, please check out both the Civil Rights Collection on our website and the World Channel's Race in America Collection on worldchannel.org. Again, thank you for spending the evening with us. Good night. Thank you.